So, I'm a giant geek. I mean, a really big geek. The very first thing, well, I shouldn't, let me say this. I want to genetically engineer everything in the world. It, it's not that popular always. <laughs> but before I was a bio geek, I was just a regular geek. I loved anything mechanical, chemistry, electrical, and computers. Computers I lost years of my life to. But I realized none of these things are important. I, I wouldn't run back into my house to rescue any piece of equipment. So when I was really thinking about what I was going to do with my life, I took inspiration from my cat, about the only thing I didn't take apart. And I, <laughs> it's like, and I realized life is priceless. Life is mysterious. And despite the fact that we are living things, we know very little about how it actually works. So I switched my majors to cell and molecular biology and genetic engineering, bottom up. Not going for medicine, bottom up. Learn about cells, the foundation of life. Learn about the operating system. Now, I knew enough about computers at that time and DNA to realize they're both code. Cells are essentially squishy little living computers. The genome is the operating system. The difference is the, the code that runs living cells are written in atoms, are written in DNA. It's not digital, it's not bits. And the problem with working with genetic code is that really it's slow. <laughs> to read the data back when I started, you had to have a lab, you had to have special training, specialized reagents to pull out the DNA molecule and manually decode it. It was time consuming and it was expensive. Then 1990 came around and something remarkable happened. U.S. scientists led a project called the Human Genome Project to read the DNA, the program of a human being. This was a really audacious project at the time because we'd only sequenced viruses. We hadn't even sequenced a single bacterium in 1990. There was a $3 billion budget allocation, massive. It was a moonshot, the biggest project ever done in life science, and it brought in the entire world. One of the outcomes of that project was that the manual work of reading DNA became automated. A device was created called a sequencer. This sequencer could work 24-7 reading DNA and automatically digitizing it. The process isn't really hard to figure out. You can, it doesn't have to be human DNA. It can be the DNA of any organism. The DNA is isolated and extracted, run through the sequencer, it's automatically digitized, and it ends up as a file on the computer. Remarkable progress was made in the decade that the Human Genome Project operated. Between launched in 1990, first draft in 2000, completed in 2003, done. But since then, the cost of sequencing DNA has plummeted, plummeted even faster than Moore's Law. It's remarkable. It is by far the fastest evolving technology on the planet. What used to cost hundreds of millions of dollars is now under $1,000, and it'll continue to get cheaper. And with all this digitization, we get connection. We get massive learning. We, are, we know more today about cellular biology and all the interconnections than ever before because we are linking all of this data together in completely new ways. And of course, you get emergent effects out of that. And if you have a connection to the cloud, all this data is pretty much available to you, too. When I started out as a bio geek, this was called bioinformatics. Today, it's much more sophisticated. It's syn systems biology because it's about networks of networks of networks of networks of information. We're mapping our world, we're mapping our bodies, we're mapping every organism, we're mapping organisms that no longer exist. 
we're connecting all of this information, but there's a problem. We can't act on much of this information yet. That's where synthetic biology comes in. Terrible name, I know that. It's not really synthetic, it's just biology. But it's the reverse process of sequencing. You start with a digital file, a text file, information. You put it into a machine called a synthesizer, hence the name. You take the raw materials of DNA and you link them together one by one to build DNA chains. It is really a DNA printer. The problem is you can only print short segments of DNA. Short segments of DNA really don't do that much. They have some utility, but it doesn't really allow you to program biology. To get a program, you have to link together DNA to make a longer strand, just like writing a longer story. Depending on how long a chain of DNA you can write, the more complex the organism you can create. Most of the first generation biotech industry just made proteins. Proteins are essentially a very short segment of DNA, roughly a thousand base pairs. Think of it as bits. Viruses are about 10,000 to 100,000. Metabolic circuits, metabolism, roughly 100,000. The smallest bacterial genomes, around a million base pairs. And after that, it just gets bigger. Yeast is about 10 million. Chromosomes in our bodies are about 100 million. And then, of course, our genomes are about 3 billion base pairs of code. Lots of different organisms, lots of different size. Once you can get up to 3 billion and more, you can be making virtually any mammal on the planet. I work for a design company now because you need code electronic code, software, to be able to write genetic code well. To write DNA, it's just not something you can do by hand. We make design tools. Three and a half years ago, they founded a bio-nano research group. I was lucky enough to be a founding member. Our job is to bring computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing to the bio-nano space. That's a tall order. <laughs> That's why I want to genetically engineer everything. I want tools to do it. But right now, we have to start really bottom up. Just engineering a simple bacterium is a tremendously difficult job. So I've started with viruses. Viruses are the biological equivalent of software, of apps, actually. Viruses are all pretty much the same. They have a shell, a capsid, a container that basically dictates what cells it can bind to. And inside, a little genetic program. Really, a virus is the biological version of a USB stick. They're not all nasty. They can deliver good programs, too. We've been making design tools for visualizing and designing viruses, starting very simple. The process is quite straightforward. It's a very small genome. The one I've been prototyping with is just over 5,000 bits of code. Today, the DNA synthesizers can print that out complete, and we end up with a little strand of DNA that's made synthetically. It's still exactly the same as natural DNA. We have to use a special trick, though, to actually get any real biology out of this. We have to put it into the cell. We do that by opening a channel in the cell, getting that DNA in there, and then the cellular metabolism reads that DNA and starts to work, and it'll produce more viruses, which we can harvest and collect and turn into tools or into therapeutics or into drugs. It's a very simple process. But the thing that I want you to understand is we make real biological viruses starting with just a data file. It's remarkable. This is synthetic virology. It took me about two weeks and $1,000 to prototype my first virus. I was following the footsteps of other scientists that did it 10 years ago. But they were Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> I'm not. And I did it without setting foot into a lab. What do you do with these tools? 
I've been on a mission really for the last decade to treat cancer with viruses because viruses are incredibly good at hunting out cells and can deliver programs. So people have been developing cancer-fighting viruses. I'm at the point now where I'm ready to move this into dogs. Why dogs? Because it's easier to work with than humans. And if a dog dies, it doesn't shut down the entire program. And because the standard of care in cancer treatment in dogs is terrible. You can't counsel a dog about chemotherapy. And the DNA synthesis tools and the design tools are getting good enough to actually do this. And the process that we're building is pretty straightforward. You start with the dog, one dog. You isolate their cancer cells. You sequence it. You profile it. The computer designs the virus that will act as a therapy. It gets synthesized. Robots make the virus. And ultimately, it's collected and ready for therapeutic use in the clinic. This is N of 1 medicine. There's no big clinical trials. You start with a problem. You engineer a solution. And viruses are incredibly cheap to make. I see a day when we don't make blockbuster drugs, best one size fits all for cancer. We make personalized medicines and a pipeline of them, a steady stream of them, a subscription, not blockbuster, Netflix. <laughs> uh -huh. And the experience that we get from doing this in dogs and cats, because they all get cancer, will help us determine what to do, how to work with humans. This will happen fast. It's all digital. Clearly, there's massive potential just with viruses. They can be diagnostics. They can be gene therapies. They can be anti-cancer. They can be antibacterial. And then, of course, if you can write larger segments of DNA, the sky's the limit. How do we accelerate this? How do we move it forward faster? If this is so good, how do we accelerate it? The biggest bottleneck today, as of today, right now, if I want to buy DNA, it costs me 10 cents a bit. Now, this is an extraordinarily cheap price compared to 15 years ago when it was $20 a bit. It's, the price has been falling exponentially. But if every key you hit on your keyboard cost you 10 cents, you would write very, very short letters. <laughs> you, would, you would only write tweets. So the way we have to move forward with this is we have to take these robot synthesizers and these robot manipulators, these lab automation systems, and just like we did with electronics, we have to put them on chips. Not electronic chips, biochips. It'll drive the cost down. We also have to make better software, user experience software, because trust me, most people have no clue about life, about cells, about the mechanisms in cells. The cool thing is if you've tried the VR systems upstairs, you can go into that world now. This is going to be a tremendous step up in design and education as this gets implemented. But for years, I've also said, we probably need another human genome project. We need another project, another moonshot, where scientists come together and focus on the human genome, but this time about writing it. And it's not about writing human genomes. It's about driving the cost down so we can write all genomes. If we do this, the cost of writing DNA will fall exponentially. Because I tell you, every time one of your cells divides in your body, it writes a human genome. All this equipment already exists. Scientists just have to learn how to tap it and control it. And if you can imagine writing a chromosome for $1,000, why not all chromosomes for $1,000? Or why not 100? Or why not 1? As the cost of DNA falls, we're going to be able to program more and more things. We'll be allowed to fail. We'll be allowed to iterate. It will get very interesting very fast. And I believe the people that learn how to do this and do this well are going to be at the forefront of a new computing industry, not based on silicon, but based on carbon. And you'll be able to manufacture just about anything you can imagine, because life really is the best manufacturing platform on this planet. 
I want to take GMOs and I want to turn them into OMGs. <laughs> it's like, holy moly, this is awesome. And I believe that this technology, seriously, I know it's powerful, I know it's important, I know it'll change the world. And I think it's about time we did, because there's a lot of problems that we need to solve this century. Thank you.